It is my privilege to welcome you to the 2021 commencement of Church Divinity School of the Pacific. I am Mark Richardson, President and Dean, and we gather as family and friends, returning alumna, and many fellow travelers in ministry to celebrate our graduates and to pray for their ministries in the years ahead. I am pleased to share this occasion with the Reverend Phil Jackson, priest in charge of Trinity Church Wall Street, who is here today representing the Board of Trustees, with Ruth Myers, Dean of Academic Affairs, Uriah Kim, President of the Graduate Theological Union, and we are blessed by the presence of our honorary degree recipients and commencement speakers, the Right Reverend Diane Bruce, Suffragan Bishop of the Diocese of Los Angeles, and the Right Reverend Mary Gray Reeves, former Bishop of the Diocese of El Camino Real, and now serving as Managing Director of the College for Bishops. Graduating students, we rejoice in your accomplishments, and we surround you with our love, our prayers, as you launch out into ministries that will stretch you and take you in paths you cannot know completely now, but will walk by faith. We believe you are ready with God's help, and we are proud of you. Fifteen months ago, we entered an era of pandemic without even faintly being able to predict then what it would mean for us now over a year later. Like schools across the country, community life on campus shut down and education took radically new forms. Church leadership across the nation struggled and found new ways to worship in their congregations while still dealing with the sorrows of inevitable disconnection and loss. The face-to-face -face smiles and words, held hands and hugs, the assurances that are communicated in our physical proximity. Across our nation, we have experienced all manner of disruption or expected practices and engagements with each other. We have mourned the loss of loved ones and grieved with others. We have discovered our own moments of isolation and loneliness and through it been able to see with new eyes the longing for community it signifies by its absence. We have been rocked in other ways too numerous to count, summed up by culture wars, racism and injustice, the fear of confronting our culture and church's heritage in truth, all cultural forms of separation and fear more profound and long-lasting than pandemic. I repeat the obvious of recent experience only to emphasize the challenges of ministry, some of it unique, in which you enter this new phase of your vocations. Yet, and this is an important yet, this convulsive experience has brought us to our roots, opened the door to awakenings we might not have experienced otherwise, seeing the gospel freshly, seeing with new eyes what it means to live out and support others in their baptismal vows, and imagining new possibilities of becoming people of God more faithfully, honestly, and courageously. The troubles of this past year truly do lead to possibilities of conversion in each one of us, transformations, and deeper trust in God's future, not our own. Your year of commencement will be remembered for many years to come, and it calls out an answer to the question we sometimes sing in choruses in our chapel, will you come and follow me if I call your name? CDSP is imagining with Trinity Church Wall Street what new aspects of leadership are called out of us as we prepare for the future of the church. It is a moment of growing collaboration when we need it most, of still greater cooperation among schools, dioceses, and their leaders. And I am thankful for the possibility of doing this with our partners in New York at Trinity, our partners here at the GTU, and with other places of theological education around our church. And finally, with dioceses represented today in your presence, dear graduates, and many others 
which are also partners past, present, and future. Members of the graduating class, we find you ready for the innovation and challenge we have named today, ready for a new era of the apostolic moment of going forth in the name of Jesus Christ, led by the Spirit. Graduates, we rejoice with you and your friends and families today. To all of our guests, it is a great pleasure to have you with us in this virtual form of gathering. Welcome once again to the Church Divinity School of the Pacific commencement of 2021. Let us pray. Almighty God, the fountain of all wisdom, enlighten by your Holy Spirit those who teach and those who learn, that rejoicing in the knowledge of your truth, they may worship you and serve you from generation to generation through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Almighty God, you sent your Son, Jesus Christ, to reconcile the world to yourself. We praise and bless you for those whom you have sent in the power of the Spirit to preach the gospel to all nations. We thank you that in all parts of the earth, a community of love has been gathered together by their prayers and labors, and that in every place, your servants call upon your name, for the kingdom and the power and the glory are yours forever. Amen. A reading from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 8, verses 40 to 56. Now when Jesus returned, the crowd welcomed him, for they were all waiting for him. Just then there came a man named Jairus, a leader of the synagogue. He fell at Jesus' feet and begged him to come to his house, for he had an only daughter, about 12 years old, who was dying. As he went, the crowds pressed in on him. Now there was a woman who had been suffering from hemorrhages for 12 years, and though she had spent all that she had on physicians, no one could cure her. She came up behind him and touched the fringe of his clothes, and immediately, her hemorrhage stopped. Then Jesus asked, Who touched me? When all denied it, Peter said, Master, the crowds surround you and press in on you. But Jesus said, Someone touched me, for I noticed the power had gone out from me. When the woman saw that she could not remain hidden, she came trembling and falling down before him, she declared in the presence of all the people why she had touched him and how she had been immediately healed. He said to her, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace. While he was still speaking, someone came from the leader's house to say, Your daughter is dead. Do not trouble the teacher any longer. When Jesus heard this, he replied, Do not fear. Only believe, and she will be saved. When he came to the house, he did not allow anyone to enter in with him except Peter, John, and James, and the child's father and mother. They were all weeping and wailing for her, but he said, Do not weep, for she is not dead, but sleeping. And they laughed at him, knowing that she was dead. But he took her by the hand and called out, Child, get up. Her spirit returned, and she got up at once. Then he directed them to give her something to eat. Her parents were astounded, but he ordered them to tell no one what had happened. Here ends the reading. For the first time in my experience, we have invited two outstanding leaders in our church to share a commencement address 
in the form of a dialogue with each other. What is not new is that we have typically chosen our speakers from among those who receive honorary degrees, and we look forward to the conferring of these degrees later in the ceremony. It is my privilege to introduce the Right Reverend Diane M. Jarden Bruce. Bishop Bruce was elected the seventh Bishop Suffragan of the Episcopal Diocese of Los Angeles on December 4th, 2009. She is the first woman to be elected bishop in the history of the diocese and was ordained May 15th, 2010. We share an important historic relationship with the Diocese of LA through our graduates over the years and through partner, partnerships in the formation of the important ministry of Bloy House years ago from which Diane Bruce is a graduate. It is also my privilege to introduce the Right Reverend Mary Gray Reeves after 13 years as a bishop of the Diocese of El Camino Real, Bishop Mary Gray Reeves resigned from this service and is now the managing director of the College for Bishops. The College for Bishops is an institution of the Episcopal Church, among other ministries that involve her teaching and consultative skills. She is a former member of the Board of Trustees of CDSP and we have interacted over the years through students from the diocese and her various ways of supporting and being present to the school. We are honored to have both of these leaders with us today, each having contributed uniquely and in outstanding ways to the Episcopal Church. They re represent a forward-looking vision of the calling we have been given. Let us pray. God, grant us the serenity to accept the things we cannot change, the courage to change the things we can, and the wisdom to know the difference. Amen. Amen. Uh, well, I'm going to to start off this conversational sermon that um, Bishop Di Diane Jardine Bruce and I are going to share together, and we invite you into this conversation. So while you are a spectator of it, uh, we hope that your heart and your mind and your spirit will be in it, and that uh, questions will arise for you and content will arise for you. Uh, we've chosen, it's a rare occasion that a preacher in our church gets to choose their text, but we did. So we chose this Luke 8, 40 through 59, and had a really great time um, with it, living with it and being in conversation with it. And it's kind of a text that's scrappy and fast moving as a story. Uh, Diane, we're swap, we were swapping stories to begin just about ministry. And I said, you know, I when I was first a bishop and El Camino Real was in a pretty rough space, it understood death and resurrection pretty well. And it was kind of in the resurrection space, recognizing that resurrection is just as hard as death. And when people would come to apply for jobs, either in the diocesan office or in a congregation, or even just to be on committees or um, commissions, I would say, you know, if you don't want to know where the toilet paper is, or you don't want to change it when the roll is out, then you need not apply because that's the space we're in. It's a scrappy space. And we're kind of in a scrappy space in COVID. Uh, just our being here present on Zoom is kind of scrappy. So I'm gonna invite Diane just to open up the text for us as we, um, we think about it. So what did you notice in the story, Diane? Well, I think what struck me most, Mary, is that Jesus wasn't in the synagogue. He wasn't just sitting there waiting for people to come to him in one place. He was out. He was with the people. He was with the crowd. He was moving around. And, and that's really important for me because, as you know, one of my, my uh, big lines that I love to say is that we need leadership in the church, clergy and lay leaders that can exegete a neighborhood as well as they can exegete a biblical text. And that's exactly what Jesus was doing. He was out looking at the need in the community and seeing what was out there, seeing who was out there. And that's where he shared his power, remember? Mm -hmm. And so, and, and, and Mary, can you talk a little bit about that? Uh, yeah, I was, I was intrigued. I mean, one of the things that I've, I noticed in the story was that Jesus didn't seem to have any control over his power. Um, you know, the woman who reaches out, who spent all her resources, I think, you know, we have two actually kind of prominent community members 
featured in this story, but she spent all her money and she just wants, uh, she wants to just touch the fringe of that garment. And Jesus doesn't even know where his power is gone. He's like, it's just going everywhere. And there's so many dynamics of the power of the holy and of the mystery of healing that is going on in that crowd. It's just, um, it's just sort of breathtaking to behold and to imagine. All we have is two characters from that crowd. Um, and and um, I'm thinking about the story you wanted to share about um, your priest and his particular gifts at, at uh, watching energy move and harnessing it. Right, exactly. Um, and thank you for setting that up that way. My uh, One of the priests in the diocese, uh, as soon as COVID hit, he started walking around the neighborhood and noticing more and more people were out of work. And he went and he revamped how they did their smaller food pantry into a much larger food pantry that was safe for people to come to. Because what he said to me is, Bishop, I'm walking around the neighborhood and what I'm seeing is people are going to be hungry and we've got to be in a position where we can feed them. And so he sensed that need in the community by exegeting that text, right? And then he moved his entire um, entire food pantry outside so that people could feel safe coming to it. I mean, all of this thought that was put into it, not because he sat behind a desk and thought about it, but he was out with he was out with the people. He was really out with the people. Yeah, and he probably doesn't even know how many dynamics and relationships were made as people gathered um, to come to the food bank. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I was um, I did a course last summer called Leadership Through Inquiry at um, MIT, and one of the modules was about composing conditions and waiting for insights. And I, I wonder, as Jesus moved from that space of the Gerasene demoniac, which is a story that comes before this one where he's alone, you know, he's, he's got a few people around, he's trying to heal this, this demoniac, and it's out in the wilderness, and then he comes in the crowd. So he composes a whole different set of conditions as he... Um, brings into the space of all of these people this potential for healing and for transformation. And um, I'm mindful that in the course, one of the things they told us was if you want to you want to compose conditions to create space for insights, uh, plan to be um, unexpectedly wrong, uh, to be unusually uncomfortable, and to be reflective quietly. And that, those three things were intrigued me, and I think they're a challenge for us in the church as we seek to go, or should go out, as you say. We should go out and be in the crowd, and it, it will be unpredictable. Things will happen. We cannot possibly uh, anticipate. And to go with that is to, is to move with the energy of, and the healing energy of Jesus uh, in our midst. I wonder what you thought about the healings themselves in our characters well, you know, it's interesting because I keep I kept on thinking that those healings were a representation of life can come again. Life can come anew, but we have to participate in it, participate in it. How are we participating in the healing? Right. Mm -hmm. So so we have a role to play as leaders in the church, just as Jesus's role um, in that moment was to bring healing and have that manifested in the way it was manifested by by healing a, a girl that everyone was thought thought was dead and by healing a woman who he didn't even know he healed mm -hmm. um, just by being able to be out um and and i liked what you said mary because i do think that sometimes we can get it wrong i do think that sometimes we can misstep but that doesn't mean we don't keep on trying because healing can't happen unless we're willing to put ourselves out there yeah yeah i heard a great quote today that if you want to learn to get good at skateboarding, you have to fall. It's like a great reminder, you know, you're only gonna learn this if you really mess it up, you know? Yeah. Um, I was thinking too about, um, Amy Jo Levine notes that about Jesus, bodies matter. Uh, he went around healing bodies. You know, we have two stories uh, where life is completely changed um, by the healing of Jesus. And I thought about, too, the body of the church. And during this time of COVID, where so much um, transformation has been invited of us, I think about, you know, how is the body of the church being healed during this time? And that for leaders that are leaving this place to go out into um, a new context of ministry, to think about that for us as the church, our own 
our own resurrection, our own uh, restoration into a, a balanced body, if you will. Uh, these are questions that it's good for us to reflect reflect on and to place ourselves in these vulnerable places in order to be healed ourselves as we go out and bear that healing in the world. You know, you're absolutely right. One of the things I noticed early on in the, in the pandemic was that we're really uh, being invited into a reformation, a time of reforming, mm -hmm. um, a time of healing, a time of reformation. And it was interesting because those that I think pivoted most easily in this were the ones that weren't afraid to get out there, make mistakes. You know, the we all have seen the bloopers, you know, where uh, recording went out of uh, early service and it was literally upside down. Um, that was one, probably one of my favorites. But we, but we can't be afraid of making a mistake. We can't be afraid of putting ourselves out there because our, we ourselves and the church will never fully heal or be reformed in this opportune time that we're being offered right now, yeah. um, really to really take that to heart, unless we're willing to put ourselves out there. You know, mm -hmm. we have the opportunity now to not only heal ourselves, but heal the neighborhoods around us in a way that's going to be transformative for all of us. But it's only mm -hmm. going to be if we embrace this time that we've all been going through, and, and many of us are not done yet, right? Many of us are still on partial lockdowns. So what does it mean uh, to be this new church, to be a, 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 to be a church in the process of healing, a church mm -hmm. that's offering healing, um, not only for ourselves, but for those around us? How are mm -hmm. we going to share how are we going to share that message? How are we going to share that power? Yeah, I think, too, the. Um, like we're talking about going out into the crowd, but actually we are also part of the crowd, you know, as the ones who are who are in need of healing. And I, I love in these two characters, their vulnerability of, you know, touching Jesus' feet and uh, grabbing Jesus' hem, you know, who knows what's going to happen, right? Like how or how he's going to respond. And we need that uh, vulnerability as we, as we move about in the world um, and do the bidding of Christ. Exactly, exactly. So I offer it to you to close us with uh, final words or prayer. Thank you. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Gracious and Holy One, we give you thanks for this time. We give you thanks for those that you have brought to this moment in their ministry as they go off to be who you have called them to be, may they never, ever lose a sense of you walking with them. May they always be prepared to walk the neighborhood as well as they can walk their sanctuary, to offer your love, your light, your healing to this world that so desperately, especially now, needs it. May they continue, because of what they've learned in this pandemic time, to be nimble, to be thoughtful, to be caring, both behind a camera and in person. All this we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.
It is my privilege and pleasure to announce the prizes and scholarships awarded this year to, and to recognize the outstanding achievements of our students. The Right Reverend Richard Millard Prize for Excellence in Preaching. The Right Reverend Richard Millard, class of 60, is the former rector of Christ Church Alameda, former bishop suffragan for the Diocese of California, former alumni director of CDSP, and former director of mission development for the Episcopal Church, and retired bishop of the Convocation of American Churches in Europe. The faculty is pleased to award this prize to Will Bryant. The Fran Toy Prize for Multicultural Ministry at a Field Education Site. In 1985, the Reverend Dr. Fran Toy, CDSP Class of 1984 and Doctor of Divinity 1996, was the first Asian American woman ordained a priest in the Episcopal Church. The Fran Toy Prize was established by the Alumni Council in 1996 to honor Fran upon her retirement from CDSP. Her passion for multicultural ministry was evident as she served the seminary as the Director of Alumna and Student Affairs. The faculty is pleased to award this prize to Peter Vasquez Schmidt. The Episcopal Preaching Foundation Award. The Episcopal Preaching Foundation is bestowed upon the graduating student who, in the estimation of the dean and faculty, has demonstrated the most improvement and aptitude in preaching. The award of $1,000 is sponsored annually by the Episcopal Preaching Foundation. The faculty is pleased to bestow this award upon Joanna Benskin. The Lawrence Christen Mickelson Preaching Scholarship. This scholarship, established by the Episcopal Church of St. John the Baptist in Aptos, California, is awarded to a CDSP student who has demonstrated outstanding promise as a preacher and a commitment to social justice and human dignity. The faculty is pleased to award this scholarship to Jennifer Crompton. The Keller Smith Scholarship for Youth Ministry. Keller Smith is Youth and Family Minister at St. John's Episcopal Church in Oakland, California. The scholarship fund was created in honor of her dedication to youth ministry and her decades of service to youth. The scholarship is awarded to a CDSP student who has demonstrated a special interest in and talent for youth ministry. The faculty is pleased to award this scholarship to Sarah Yo. The Awarding of Degrees Honoris Causa. A native of Pequinock, New Jersey, Bishop Diane Bruce began her life on another coast. And when you sit with her in conversation, it does not take long to detect the ring of her New Jersey accent as the dialect that still carries the cadence, cultural attitude, and wonderful sense of humor familiar to all who know her. Bishop Bruce is married to G. Stephen Bruce, and they are parents of two adult children, Max and Jardine, and a grandparents of Neil Shankar Bruce. After her undergraduate degree, Diane Bruce first entered a 17-year career in finance at Wells Fargo Bank, where she was eventually a vice president. Her discernment then led toward ordained ministry. She entered the program of studies at Bloy House and Claremont School of Theology, receiving her Master of Divinity degree from Claremont School of Theology in 1997. Her first major ministry was her call to be the rector of St. Clement's by the Sea Church in San Clemente, California. And after 10 years in this ministry, in 2009, she was elected suffragan bishop in the Diocese of Los Angeles and consecrated in May of 2010, the first woman to be elected bishop in the history of the diocese.
Her doctorate of ministry degree was undertaken at Seabury Western Theological Seminary, well known for its concentration in congregational development. She would put this to use in her ministry from the very start. Bishop Bruce is known for her tireless efforts to build congregations in the Diocese of Los Angeles and for her teaching and leadership on stewardship in all manner of things pertaining to Christian faith, but surely as it pertains to congregational health, vitality, and mission. She knows the power of community organizing and has encouraged the skills of organizing in her diocese as vital to a congregation's mission to its neighborhood. It is noteworthy that Bishop Bruce received her bachelor's degree from the University of California's Distinguished Department of Linguistics. The love of and gift for language would not be lost in her priestly and Episcopal vocation. Bishop Bruce celebrates the Eucharist in Spanish, Mandarin, Cantonese, and New Jersey English in a multicultural, multi-ethnic ministry that honors and welcomes the diverse gifts of the diocese. Her capacity of the language is not a hobby. For her, it is respect for how indigenous cultural roots are expressed in one's native tongue. And the labor of honoring this is in one's ministry has become essential to the way she is known, the way she serves congregations, and the way she lifts up diversity as a sign of the beauty of God's world. What makes her unique, asks Canon Dr. Stephen Nishibayashi, lay leader in the Diocese of Los Angeles and member of the Executive Council of the Episcopal Church. He states, She is a people person and not just a purple person. She is frequently called upon to end a meeting, including in the House of Bishops, where she is secretary to the House, with a joke of the day, just before the official blessing. All who enter her life are drawn to Bishop Bruce's energy, her love of life, and her humor. It is infectious, and she keeps it very real in her relationships. Canon Nishibayashi adds, Bishop Bruce is relentless and renowned for her handmade thank you notes, which are intended to be kept and used as bookmarks. And so today we return these words to say, thank you, Bishop Bruce. We honor you for a beautiful ministry. Diane M. Jardine Bruce, for your gifts so generously offered of pastoring priests and congregations, for your commitment to the flourishing of multicultural communities in the Episcopal Church, for your humor and down-to-earth engagement with all people you encounter, and for 11 years of faithful service as suffragan bishop of the Diocese of Los Angeles. By the authority committed to me by the Board of Trustees of the Church Divinity School of the Pacific, and in agreement with its faculty, I confer upon you the degree of Doctor of Divinity Honoris Causa, together with the hood and all other rights, privileges, and dignities pertaining thereto. Born and raised in Miami, Florida, Bishop Mary Gray Reeves was baptized at St. Stephen's Episcopal Church, where she came to know Jesus, the love of community, and the power of the Spirit. Today, each of these phrases makes sense if you want to know who Mary Gray Reeves is. She received her undergraduate degree in history from Cal State Fullerton in 1987 and then ventured to St. John's Theological College, Auckland, New Zealand for her MDiv degree. Her years in New Zealand, getting to know indigenous cultures and experiencing the life of the Anglican Communion in another location, greatly expanded her consciousness of the Church's world presence. Dr. Jenny Tepa, at the time Mary's young Maori professor at St. John's, stated that they bonded nearly immediately. And I quote, I suspect because we were outsiders in different ways. She, as an American, and me as the wrong color, clerical status, and gender as a seminary professor. Mary and I forged a sisterly bond unbroken to this day.
End of quote. After her ordination into the diaconate and then priesthood in Los Angeles, Bishop Mary served in congregational ministries there and later in southeastern Florida, where she eventually was appointed archdeacon for deployment. Mary Gray Rees was elected and consecrated as Bishop of the Diocese of El Camino Real in 2007. Her diocesan ministry in El Camino Real is marked by ingenious team building, attention to organizational systems as a source of empowering mutual ministry, and new strides in strengthening both lay and ordained ministries in the diocese. She spearheaded the move of the diocesan headquarters to downtown Salinas as a sign of the church's presence in the revitalizing of Salinas's neighborhoods. Her ministry is marked by regular group reflections on the scriptures as a living source of guidance for those she leads. Bishop Mary Gray Reeves married Michael Reeves in 1982 for an adventurous and loving 32 years. And together they were parents of two children, Kate and Dorian, until Michael's tragic and untimely death in 2014. The sudden and tragic loss of her husband occurred during her Episcopal ministry in El Camino Real, and it shook the diocese. Yet, in spite of this loss, she continued her ministry there as a sign of faith in God as a source of strength and as a model for others of honest struggle in the face of tragedy. Mary is known as a gifted and dynamic preacher who speaks from the heart and trusts the Spirit's movement in both preacher and people of God in the moment of the spoken word. She is also known for her ministry of pastoral support and gathering of young, newly ordained clergy women of the church, both to help them develop cohort support and in addressing the unique challenges of women in ordained ministries. In 2019, in recognition of her mentoring gifts, the presiding bishop of the church, Michael Curry, appointed Bishop Mary to be the new managing director of the College for Bishops an institution of formation and continuing education for bishops. In a time of unusually large turnover in the Episcopacy, this has become an especially significant point of service as new bishops begin their ministries. Dr. Jenny Tepa states again, It is Mary, treasured friend and sister, I feel so blessed to claim. She is so utterly deserving of being honored, an outstanding model in ministry, an exceptional contributor to theological formation nationally and globally. The title, Dr. Mary Gray Reeves, sounds perfect. Bishop Mary Gray Reeves, we and the church as a whole are blessed by your ministry, and we thank you. Mary Gray Reeves, for your adventurous spirit, faithfulness to what God's Spirit is calling forth in each moment, for your preaching, team building, and mentoring skills generously offered as bishop in our church by the authority committed to me by the Board of Trustees of the Church Divinity School of the Pacific and in agreement with its faculty, I confer upon you the degree of Doctor of Divinity, honoris causa, together with the hood and all other rights, privileges, and dignities pertaining thereto. The awarding of the Certificate of Anglican Studies. Mr. Chairman, I have the honor to present these students who have satisfactorily completed the curriculum of study and upon recommendation of the faculty, have been approved by the Board of Trustees to receive the Certificate of Anglican Studies. By the authority vested in me by the Board of Trustees of the Church Divinity School of the Pacific and upon recommendation of its faculty, I am pleased to grant these candidates the Certificate of Anglican Studies, indicating their successful completion of the prescribed course of studies. Daniel McMillan. 
Robin Woodbury. The awarding of the Certificate of Theological Studies. Mr. Chairman, I have the honor to present this student who has satisfactorily completed the curriculum of study and upon recommendation of the faculty has been approved by the Board of Trustees to receive the Certificate of Theological Studies. By the authority vested in me by the Board of Trustees of the Church Divinity School of the Pacific and upon recommendation of its faculty, I am pleased to grant this candidate the Certificate of Theological Studies, indicating her successful completion of the prescribed course of studies. Dawn Marie Reynolds. The conferring of the degree of Master of Theological Studies. Mr. Chairman, these persons have satisfactorily completed the curriculum for the degree of Master of Theological Studies and upon recommendation of the faculty have been approved for the degree of Master of Theological Studies by the Board of Trustees. I have the honor to present them asking that you grant them the appropriate diplomas and confer hoods emblematic of the degree of Master of Theological Studies together with all other attendant rights, privileges, and dignities. By the authority vested in me by the Board of Trustees of the Church Divinity School of the Pacific and upon recommendation of its faculty, I am pleased to confer upon these persons the degree of Master of Theological Studies and to give them hoods signifying this degree together with all the rights, privileges, and dignities pertaining thereto. Evan Herbert Britton. Anton Feinberg, Myrna Louise Kuntz, Yuki Faith Moore, Peter J. Vasquez Schmidt, Elizabeth Erringer Sims, Jana Patrice Sundin. The conferring of the degree of Master of Divinity. Mr. Chairman, these persons have satisfactorily completed the curriculum of the degree of Master of Divinity and upon recommendation of the faculty have been approved for the degree of Master of Divinity by the Board of Trustees. I have the honor to present them asking that you grant them the appropriate diplomas and confer hoods emblematic of the degree of Master of Divinity together with all attendant rights, privileges and dignities. By the authority vested in me by the Board of Trustees of the Church Divinity School of the Pacific and upon recommendation of the faculty, I am pleased to confer upon these persons the degree of Master of Divinity and to give them hoods signifying this degree together with all the rights, privileges, and dignities pertaining thereto. Joanna Elizabeth Benskin. William Smith Bryant, Brian Paul Cleary, Catherine Lois McCarthy Evanbeck, Kathy Ellen Lawler, Laura J. Osborne, Sue Ellen Johnson Pamier, Deborah Geller Rhodes, Patricia Marie Rose. The relationship within the Graduate Theological Union is a vital part of CDSP's life and program. And so once again, I am delighted to welcome the ninth president of the Graduate Theological Union, Dr. Uriah Kim, to present the GTU degree of Master of Arts to a student affiliated within the Church Divinity School of the Pacific. Uriah Kim, also the John Dillenberger Professor of Biblical Studies at the GTU, has contributed to scholarship in Asian American biblical hermeneutics in a post-colonial context. After completing degrees at New York University, Princeton Theological Seminary, and Candler School of Theology, President Kim completed his PhD here at the Graduate Theological Union in 2004 
and in 2005 was appointed Professor of Hebrew Bible at Hartford Theological Seminary. Uriah Kim, we are honored to have you with us for your remarks and for this presentation. Thank you so much, President Richardson, for such a kind introduction. I am very pleased to bring you greetings on behalf of the Graduate Theological Union. For nearly 60 years, the students in our member schools have been learning together and the faculty and staff have been collaborating together to create something special in the theological landscape. This remarkable consortium of schools, centers, and affiliates has given us a lot. The best theological library in the Western United States arguably the most vibrant and diverse theological community in North America, and a pedagogical model of collaborative engagement across differences. But the best gift of them all, the GTU has given to the world is its students. Those of you graduating from the Church Divinity School of the Pacific, both contributed to and benefited from this extraordinary community. Graduates, on behalf of all your colleagues throughout the GTU, I offer you congratulations on your accomplishments and best wishes as you embark on whatever adventures await you in the future. We are proud of you and grateful for what you have brought us in your time here. May you be blessed during this celebration so that you may continue to be a blessing for others. The conferring of the degree of Master of Arts. President Kim, this person has completed all requirements for the degree of Master of Arts and has been recommended by the faculty of the Church Divinity School of the Pacific and by the faculty of the Graduate Theological Union and has been designated by the trustees of both institutions to receive this degree. I have the honor to present him, asking that you grant him the appropriate diploma and confer the hood emblematic of the degree of Master of Arts, together with all attendant rights, privileges, and dignities. Upon the recommendations of the faculty of the Church Divinity School of the Pacific, and the faculty of the Graduate Theological Union, and by the authority assigned to me by their boards of trustees. I am pleased to grant this person the degree of Master of Arts and to give him the hood signifying this degree, together with all the rights, privileges, and dignities pertaining thereto. Thomas Ethan Lowry. And now Professor Julian Gonzalez will share a word of congratulations to the graduates on behalf of the faculty, followed by a message from former superintendent of buildings, grounds and security, Steve Sibbett, who retired at the end of February. Queridos graduandos, buenos dias. In the current world of social distancing, Graduation is just one of the many celebrations that has been impacted. What was supposed to be an auditorium filled with high spirits, proud scholars, and supportive friends and family is now online ceremonies and male diplomas. But to you graduates, know that your hard work has not gone unnoticed. No matter if your cap and gown has been replaced by sweatpants, probably pajamas, or your celebratory hugs with virtual high fives, you are still celebrated, still recognized, and still loved. So class of 2021, we want to reassure you that the tassel was indeed worth the hassle. We applaud you, you did it. Celebrate your accomplishments and look to the future. May your vision and your love not just change the world, but make a world of change 
for everyone that you can. Vayan con Dios. Congratulations. God go with you. Great job. God go with you. Hello and good morning. And no adjustment of your settings are necessary. It is indeed Steve, the maintenance man, the ex-maintenance man at CDSP that you are hearing and seeing on your screen right now. Okay, why? Well, I've been involved in the last 24 commencement exercises at CDSP, so why not make it 25? All of you are in the class of 2021. You are my 25th and final class, as I too became a member of a class of 2021. For nearly three months ago, almost three months ago, I became a member of the retired folks class of 2021. By correlation, that means you guys are the last and final class that I will be actively involved with at CDSP. That's going to hold fond memories to me, a special place in my heart, because we all know you remember your first, which I do vividly, but now I can remember my last. That is you, the class of 2021. As I enter uh, the state, uh, my next chapter of my life, I'm an old curmudgeonly guy living on a fixed income. As I enter that chapter, I kind of want to touch upon yours. We all know and experience what happened to us beginning about 14 months ago, and it continues today. When the turmoil of our lives, we, we became, uh, it became upside down and inside out, a world where all the furniture was moved around and we had to choose a different path. It was a world where we were forced into physical isolation or at least semi-isolation where we lived in a defined community. In that community, you had to behave in a particular way to safeguard not only yourself, but the others in your community. And I know much of many of you like I did could have questioned reasons why. What am I doing here? Why am I doing it? Um, by answering that question, that's the power of purpose. By answering that question, if you asked it, you have proved to yourself power of purpose because purpose got you here today. But not only will your purpose stop, it does not stop today, it'll continue in the many tomorrows wherein you will take that power of purpose Give it away to all those folks you now come in contact with. And I applaud you for getting here today, and I applaud you for the many tomorrows you will bring to others um, in sharing their grief when you console another, when you teach another, when you preach to another. So Godspeed and God bless all of you.
Let us pray. Accept, O Lord, our thanks and praise for all that you have done for us. We thank you for the splendor of the whole creation, for the beauty of this world, for the wonder of life, and for the mystery of love. We thank you for the blessing of family and friends, and for the loving care which surrounds us on every side. We thank you for setting us at tasks which demand our best efforts, and for leading us to accomplishments which satisfy and delight us. We thank you for those disappointments and failures that lead us to acknowledge our dependence on you alone. Above all, we thank you for your Son, Jesus Christ, for the truth of his word and for the example of his life, for his steadfast obedience by which he overcame temptation, for his dying through which he overcame death, and for his rising to life again in which we are raised to the life of your kingdom. Grant us the gift of your Spirit, that we may know Christ and make him known, and through him, at all times and in all places, may give thanks to you in all things. Amen. And now, as our Savior taught us, we pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Live without fear. Your Creator has made you holy and has protected you and loves you as a mother. Go in peace to follow the good road, and may God's blessing be with you always. Amen.